Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. And, you know, we have almost got through the book of Romans. Uh, we, uh, we started this whole journey and looking through the book of Romans and, and looking at the reasons of what, what we believe, why we believe what we believe, and, and we're getting towards the end. In fact, uh, this is sort of the last of the chapters that really has a lot to do with theology. Um, and the next chapter is, is going to be uh, Paul's uh, closing of his letter. And you might be going, well, what do we need to study that? And, and we are, uh, but there's a, there's a purpose to that. But we're going to get to that next week. Uh, but as we finish up the, the theology part of, of Romans, we're going to be in Romans chapter 15. And, and I'm calling this, this chapter, I'm calling this sermon, I'm calling it Bearing Burdens. You know, we, we, have, we have been called to help each other, to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know, that, that can be a hard thing sometimes because, you know, when we look through this life, you know, it, it, is, it is a rough go. You know, ha, have you ever been hiking? Have you ever been out in the woods or, or out in the mountains and stuff like this? Picture shows where you've got somebody who is, who is struggling trying to get through or maybe they've injured themselves or something. You, you have to give them some support. In fact, in life, Sometimes it feels like we're carrying a ton of burdens. You know, do you feel like sometimes that you, you just have the whole weight of the world on your shoulders? You've got so many concerns, so many things, whether it's financial or health or, or whatever. If you feel like this guy. You feel like you're just getting weighed down. And, and the thing of it is, is when we feel like that, sometimes we, we need a brother or sister to be able to come beside us and help share the burden. Because, you know, sometimes we, we get so stressed, we get so overloaded that we just don't know, we don't see hope. Now, I've seen this in, in life. Now, you might be going, this, this is a much smaller bag. And maybe you, maybe you recognize this bag. You know, this bag belongs to my son. And you might be going, well, why, why are you showing my, your son's backpack? Well, Lucas has type 1 diabetes, as many of you know. And, and so he has to carry medical supplies around with him all the time. He always has to have it. He has to have stuff in case his blood sugar tanks and he has to have things to be able to like inject himself so he, he can keep himself alive. And so he has to have an entire medical kit he takes with him anytime he's away from the house. And so that, that means that he has to carry this everywhere with you. Now, ladies, you, you know this more than, than the guys, but uh, does your purse get heavy every once in a while? Okay. Well, what if, what if you couldn't just say, well, I'm just going to take the essentials. I'm just going to take my ID and my wallet and that sort of stuff. I'm going to leave the rest at home. Well, sometimes that means that Lucas's backpack gets heavy and he's like, can, can somebody help me out here? And when, he, when that happens, I say, sure, boy, give me, give me your bag. And I'll, I'll carry his bag for him. Now, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but I'm sure he feels a lot better when he doesn't have that thing on his back. And so it's something to be able to help each other. You know, sometimes it's something easy. Sometimes we, we go and, and, and it might be something as, as simple as mowing somebody's yard. You know, we, I have some neighbors that I, I love dearly, and, and, you know, I like to mow their yard for them. I, whenever I mow my yard, I mow their yard, and we, we keep it so so the corner of our our uh, our little area on the street is is you know uniform and all that sort of stuff, and it looks nice whenever I get out there. And yeah, I probably need to get out there a few more times, but I like to help people. I like to be able to shoulder some of the burden. It's not a lot, but it's something. And that's what we're called to do for our brothers and sisters in Christ is, is when you see somebody who's struggling or has difficulty to step beside them and help them. And so why, why is this so important? Well, we're going to take a look at, at what God's word says to us. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 1. And so last week we looked at, you know, those who are strong, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't, you know, uh, use their, their strength to, to make the, the weak feel bad. Those who are weak shouldn't look bad at the, the... But here's what it says here. First one, it says, When then we who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. So we need to bear the burdens of those that are struggling. You know, we need to be there for each other. <clears throat> do, we, do we go and... and 
and help lift the burdens of somebody. Now, now you go, well, how can I do that? Well, if somebody's, if somebody's struggling with, with some emotional, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling with some emotional weight, some, some difficult things, have you called them or talked to them just to cheer them up a little bit? You know, if somebody's struggling with, hey, you know, I, I, could, I could really use some, some groceries, do you, do you go and help them get some groceries? You know, we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're supposed to be family and help each other. We're going to spend eternity with one another. Can we help each other when, when they need help? Now, we can't always take care of every problem, every issue. You know, sometimes the, the burden is bigger than what we can do. And so where, where are we supposed to go when it's a bigger burden than what we can deal with? We're supposed to go to the cross. But we, we see that the very first thing it says that those who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, and not to please ourselves. We, we need to use the strength that the Lord has blessed us with to help others. And so the question is, are we, are we doing that? Are we lifting the burdens? Are we helping our brothers and sisters? So let's keep going to verse 2 and 3. It says, Let, let each of us uh, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as is written... The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So this is kind of an unusual thing. You know, we've been going through Romans and we've been talking about Jesus' sacrifice and why it was and all this. This is one of the very few times in the book of Romans that we're, we're told to look directly at Jesus and his example. And so what does this mean? It means that we need to follow the, the example of Jesus. Jesus did not come to be served. He didn't come and say, okay, I'm here. I'm ready for you to, to feed me. I'm ready for you to take care of me. I'm ready for you to... Now, was there anybody on the face of the earth that actually deserved to be served more than Jesus? I mean, he, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He was with his Father. They, they, they spoke the universe into existence. When, when humanity was made, Jesus was there. It says that everything was made for, for Jesus and by Jesus. You know, we, we look at that and we, we say, you know, do, was there anyone that more deserved to be served when he came to earth than Jesus? And there isn't. But when we look at his life, what, what do we see? We see, you know, the one that should have been born in the greatest of all palaces, that everybody should have bowed down and worshipped him, that, that, you know, we see he was born in a, in a stable he was laid in a feeding trough. He had strips of cloth swaddling clothes that he was, he was, I mean, he didn't even have a one, you know, all my kids had these little swaddle sacks and all this sort of stuff. He didn't even have that. He had strips of cloth that was ripped and wrapped around him to keep him warm. His birth was announced by the angels. and It was the most glorious birth announcement that ever has been, but it was announced to shepherds. Second class people, you know, the ones that weren't thought that highly of, that maybe smelled a little funny. This was who, who the Lord said, this is the people I need to announce the birth of my son to. Now, now it's believed that the shepherds that, that were, the birth was announced to were the ones that looked over the sacrificial flock. And so when they saw Jesus and they saw how he was cared for and what was done, that they realized they have seen the Lamb of God. That was there to take away the sins of the world. And they, I, I think that, that they got that. You know, I think very few people could have understood the message that God was sending. Those people could. And so those were who the birth was announced to. But then we see later on that, that yes, the, the kings and the mighty ones did come. But they came from far away. The ones that were close were looking to kill him. It was the ones that were far away that came and they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And when we look at those gifts, they declare Jesus' life and his death. You know, the gold was a gift of a king. The, the, the frankincense was, was a sweet-smelling thing that you would use in temple worship. It was a gift of a priest. The myrrh was a gift of a dead man that you would give to somebody to embalm somebody with. And so the gifts declare what Jesus came to do. We see... As he lived, you know, he, he lived with, with Mary and Joseph, and, and we don't see a whole lot. We just see a little snippet of his childhood, but we know that, that he never sinned during his life. We know that he did what he was supposed to. And then we see him 
starting his ministry. And here he is going and telling about the kingdom of God, and he's calling his disciples. And, you know, he has, he has no home. He has no place to lay his head. He, he just travels. He's about the business of God. He's going and serving. He's getting up before the sun rises to pray. He's spending all day. He's, he's working into the night doing miracles. He's getting very little sleep. He's trying to teach and to show. And then, after three years of that, he dies. He's accused of things that he never did. He's given this, this sham of a trial. People that, that should have, have been looking for him and worshipped him and, and welcomed him with open arms wanted nothing to do with him because they, he threatened their power. And so we're told to look at his example. That he didn't come to, to please himself. He came to be a servant. And so Paul, in one of the very few times he's telling us to look at Jesus and follow his example, he's saying, we need to be servants. And we need to serve one another. Now why do you think that this is in the book of Romans? Remember, Paul has not been to Rome. This book is, he, he's, he's desperate to get to these people. The church has already been started. He's, he's heard such great things. But, you know, his, his job was he was, the, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He'd been so caught up, and, and the Holy Spirit has moved him in all these different places to go, all these different churches. Here was the mightiest city in the world that had the most impact, the most influence. Paul did not start that church. Nor did he get to go visit that church while he was a free man. The, the time he actually got to go there, he was in chains as a prisoner going to Rome to, to call before Caesar to hear his case. But yet he takes the time and writes this letter to them to make sure they understand the basics of faith. And yet, in this, in this chapter 15, as he's getting ready to close, he's saying the final words, he says... Be a servant to one another. Why is this so important? Why is this in, in part of his closing theology that he's sharing with the Roman church? Why is this so important? Look at the world today. Does anybody do anything for somebody out of the kindness of their heart? Or are they always looking for something? Do you see anybody who just generally serves people? It's hard. You know, when I went to school, I, I took a psychology class, and me and, the, me and the professor got in a big argument. Yeah, don't, don't, no, no, never let it be said that I'm not willing to argue with my professors, because I will, and I have. <laughs> my professor said, you know, there's no such thing as altruism. It, altruism is, is just, you're trying to make yourself look good. I said, sir, I absolutely disagree with you, because I know that I love the Lord, and I want to look good with Him, and I want to help people. I want to see good for them. I want to see them know the same Savior that I know. And I told him, I, I disagree with you. I think you can do good for the sake of doing good. But he, he just absolutely said, that's impossible. It's not, you know, there's always some underlying motive for your benefit. And that's the way the world works. And so why is, why is he telling us to be servants to one another? Because it is a witness to the world around us that there is something different when we look at each other, when we say, let me help you, let me be there for you, I see you struggling, let me carry that burden for you, it is so different than the rest of the world that it proclaims Jesus. And so he's telling us, follow our Savior's example. He says, you know, the, Christ didn't please himself as is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell upon me. You know, not only... What, did, did the Lord endure all the hardships and stuff? He said we would too, but, but these people weren't wanting to listen to the Lord. They weren't wanting to listen to God. And so he, he felt the people's reproach upon him. So let's keep going here. Verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. And we through the pa uh, patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 
Now many, uh, may the God of patience and comfort grant to you uh, to be like-minded towards one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may, go, uh, may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what, what is he saying here? What does this mean? He's saying that, that God's word is written for our, our instruction and our comfort. You know, they, they, were, they were talking about the Old Testament. We have the entire Bible to look at, but it, it's written to encourage us because we see that, that when, we are, when we humble ourselves and we're a servant to one another, there is something good that happens from that. God gets glory for it. We help our brothers and sisters. We build up the kingdom. We're an example to those that's around us, and it is a great and wonderful thing. It is not pointless. When we serve each other, it doesn't matter if anyone else has seen it. It doesn't matter if you do it in secret. God sees it. You know, we, we talked about last week that, that, you know, all Christians are going to stand in front of Jesus. You know, there's, there's two judgments. There's the great white throne judgments, and that's the, the ones that the people who don't know Christ. And then there's the, the throne room of Jesus. There, there's the throne of, of the king. And we, all of our stuff is put before Jesus and the things that we did for ourselves burn up and, and, and go, goes away. But the things we did for him, it comes back as, as gold and precious gems and is a testament. What an awesome thing. So the things that you do to help a brother or sister, the things that you do to, to, to lift each other up in prayer and the things that no one ever sees, God sees them. And they're not for naught. But look, you know, I love this, this other bit here. It says that, that the, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you be like-minded towards one another. That you would all care for one another. That you would all love one another. And it says, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I'm, I'm taking a class down at seminary and it, it is... It is a class that is absolutely unexpected what it actually is. It's Christian ethics. And it's, it's specifically Christian ethics is worship. And when I went in, I was expecting an ethics class. You know, the study of what's right and wrong and how do we do that. And I was like, okay, Christian ethics. Well, we have a list. We have God's word. We know what's right and wrong. We don't have to evaluate it and think what we have a definite. But they said, you know, what Christian ethics really is, is worshiping God. It's fulfilling our creative purpose. You know, that's what humanity was created for, was to glorify God. And when we do good things, when we do right things, when we live according to how God wants us, we are worshiping Him. Worship just isn't us singing songs. It isn't just being here and listening to, to me talk. Worship is how we live our lives and how we show the world about Jesus. And so he's saying that we would be united, that we would be unified in our purpose. That we would worship the Lord together. Do we worship the Lord together? Are we, are we excited about coming to come together and, and sing to, to our King, to, to love Him, to learn about Him together, to come together before Him? Are we excited about that? Because we should be. Because that is what we were created to do. We are fulfilling our purpose. You know, people say, I, 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 just don't, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. I just, I just feel like everything's just pointless and all this. This is the point. This is what we're meant to do. This is what we were created to do. There is nothing as fulfilling in life as fulfilling our created purpose. And you might be going, I don't know about, you know, I can tell you throughout my life, I can think about the times I was truly joyful and a great majority of them come to the times I was worshiping the Lord with brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what we were made to do. And this is what he's saying, that, that we would be united, that we'd help each other, that we'd be there together. You know, when, when we have brothers and sisters who are struggling, they're trying to lift those backpacks and those bags of, of cares and worries. How are they able to worship? But when we help our brothers and sisters take those, those burdens to the foot of the cross and they leave them there at the foot of the cross and they have relief because they've laid it down and says, Lord, I can't deal with this anymore. You've got to deal with it. And the Lord says, thank you. I've been waiting for you to bring this here. Then we can rejoice together. What a, what a wonderful thing that is. 
to be able to lay down our, our burdens and, and rejoice and thank the Lord for the fact that he cares for us enough to say, hey, I want those things. Bring them to me. Let's keep going. Verse 7. It says, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to, all, to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and to the Gentiles and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as is written. For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, These shall, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he, shall, he who shall reign uh, over the Gentiles, to him, or in him, the Gentiles shall hope. So when we look at this, we, we see that, that when Jesus came, he, you know, his ministry was to his people. It was to the Jews first. And we see he was going and telling the people, and, and why? Because he was fulfilling the promise that God had made. God says, I'm going to send you the Messiah. I'm going to send you the promised one. I'm going to send you the one that's going to take care of things. But it, Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. He also came for us. And so we see that, that God fulfilled his promise to the, the Jews, and he sent Jesus. But then also that we would glorify God and for his mercy. And we see quote after quote of the Old Testament where he's saying that the Gentiles, us, the other people that are not Jews, would, would come together and we would rejoice. You know, what an awesome thing. When we look at this, you know, we have this question, what does it mean that the gospel, uh, that, that the gospel will uh, bring salvation to the Jew first and then the Gentile? You know, God was fulfilling his promise. We look back at, at, at the promises that was made. We look back to the very first promise where, where you know, it was Adam and Eve and, and God was talking to Eve and he was telling her that one of her descendants would crush the head of the snake. And so this promise was brought down. We look and continue on and we see you know, Noah and the ark. And it was, it was a sign of what was going to happen that, that God was going to send salvation we look and we go all the way to Abraham and we look up on Mount Moriah when Abraham offered Isaac. And when there was no suitable sacrifice to offer, God provided one. Now, you know what, what's interesting? Remember, when, when we think about sacrificing animals and stuff of that nature, when we think about the sacrifice, you know, we think of, oh, it's a lamb that's a year old, it's without blemish, without spot. Do you remember what that first sacrifice went when Abraham was up there on, on the mountain with, with Isaac? Do you remember what was used for the sacrifice? It wasn't a year old lamb. It was a ram that was fully grown. Now you go, why, why was that? What did God use as his perfect lamb? He used his son who was in his 30s, fully grown man. They had lived a perfect life that willingly laid down his life for ours. That ram was a testimony of who Jesus was going to be. It wasn't going to be a little baby that was sacrificed. It wasn't going to be a kid. It was going to be a fully grown man that was going to pay the price. What an awesome thing when we think about it. You know, he was fulfilling that promise, but remember, with Abraham, he made this promise that not only would God bless his descendants, Abraham's blood descendants, but they would also make him a blessing for the entire world. And we see that that's exactly what Jesus did for all of us. You know, we see throughout the ministry of Jesus that there's, there's Gentiles that come up to him. Do you remember the, the, the centurion that asked Jesus for help? Do you remember? Do you remember what Jesus said about this man? Remember the centurion, his, his servant was sick and and he comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, okay, let's go. We'll, we'll go take care of him. And the centurion says, oh, no, 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 no. I am not worthy to have you in my house, but I'm a commander of men. When I tell somebody to go, they go. When I tell them to come, they come. You say the word, and it will happen. Remember what Jesus said about this man? Greater faith in all of Israel have not found. He got it. When we think about 
you know, the coming of, of the gospel and the, the coming of the good news and, and the salvation of the Gentiles, we think about Cornelius. You remember when, when you know, it's kind of this neat thing, you know, Jesus promised to Peter, he says, you, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. And people wonder, well, what is that talking about? You know, the Catholics believe that he's talking about the, oh, we're, we're setting up the Pope and all this sort of stuff. But here's one of the neat things. When, when the Holy Spirit came to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, who preached the first sermon? Peter. When, when people were, were coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but, but, the, but the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet to the Samaritans. And Peter and John go up there and they pray and they lay hands on them and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Who was there? Peter came up there. And then Cornelius. You know, here was this centurion. He was... He was, he was the, a Gentile of Gentiles because he was of the Italian regiment. Okay? Now you might go, well, what does that have to do with it? You know, Rome encompassed so much territory. There was a lot of Roman soldiers that weren't Roman. Okay? They were all these different countries and they, they signed up for service and all this sort of stuff. A man of the Italian regiment, this was, this was an Italian Roman Rome guy. I mean, he was as Rome as you get. And he loved the Lord, and he was praying, and he was at, and the angel said, hey, go send for Peter, and he's going to tell you what you need to do. And so he does, and Peter gets the vision of the sheet and, and understands that, hey, I can go with these people, and he does. And as he begins to talk, you know, here's Cornelius. He has his entire family, all of his friends, everybody gathered. It's like, you've got to come. The man of God's going to come, and he's going to tell us what we need to do. And as Peter is still speaking, he hadn't even finished yet. He hadn't even finished that, and this is what you got to do. As he was speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And he says, I've seen it, and, and there is no doubt that the Lord has come, not only to the Jew, not to the, only to the Samaritan, but everyone. And so we see what a wonderful, wonderful thing. So, so the Lord comes for all that we can all celebrate together. Let's go to verse 13. It says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this is an interesting close to that, that whole thing. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you, do you understand when it talks about hope, what it means? Because we, we use this word, and when we use this word, we go, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. And, and, and it's just like, well, it's my greatest wish, or, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, maybe, when it talks about hope here, it is an assured thing. It's coming. We haven't seen it yet, but we know it's true because he said it was coming. Do you see how awesome this is? He says, may the God of hope, the one that is going to fulfill his word, who is going to make sure that, that our hope in him, that we trust for, for Jesus for salvation, he is going to fulfill it. He's saying, the hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing. Now, now, some people go, well, joy in that happiness? Or does that mean we're supposed to be? No. That means we trust God that he has a plan for us in the good times and the bad times. That we can hold on to this understanding that God loves us. It, it is joy. It is something that even when things are going ugly and we don't understand it, we can trust that God's got a plan He's got this. He's got me. He says peace and believing. You know, when, we, when we're struggling, we need that peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding. That we, we can hold on to him and say, Lord, I don't, I don't see how it's going to work. But you said it is, and I know you can't lie. And I'm holding on to that, and you're go I'm going to see it. That is what he's talking about. And this is, this is the conclusion here. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And believing that you may abound in hope. That you can, you can have this, this great trust in what God is going to you, do by the power of the Holy Spirit. That we know that He is going to do this. You know, I, I, I literally seen something that broke my heart today. I was, I was on Facebook and I was trying to wake up this morning. You know, when I get up, I'm a little tired and feel a little glassy eyed. And so sometimes I'll turn my phone on, and, and I seen this, this little video, 
and it was a person saying, oh, you know, Re Revelation has nothing to do with the end of the world. It was all about Rome, and it was secret language and all that sort of stuff. And I, I, I literally just sat there, and I'm like, do you see the world today and what's going on? And you're telling me that has nothing? I, I, I'm like, and today we're going chapter and verse, you know, chapter whatever. Here's the prophecy, and here's what's going on in the world today. I'm like, are you kidding me? We see it. The clock is ticking down, people. There's no denying it. There's no, I, I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable. I want to duck my head in the ground. It's here. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to be the people that God's called us to be? Because guess what? We are here for a purpose. We're here for a purpose. He didn't go, oh, well, I made a mistake. I should have had Abraham and I should have had Elijah there at that time because they, they, they would have a lot more. He put us here. Why did he put us here? He put us here for a reason. Are we going to be found faithful when the boss comes back? When the boss comes back for us, what is he going to see us doing? Is he going to see us living for him? Is he going to see us trying to share the gospel and trying to tell people about who Jesus is and what he's done for him and loving people and, and living a life that is glorifying to him? Or is he going to see us ducked and covered and trying to hide and, and oh my, it's, it's... We're the people he's put here. And I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I won't see the Lord come back. Maybe the Lord has a different plan. But I'm telling you, I, I, I don't think that. I don't think that there's going to be too many of us that's in this room that's going to miss it. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to be found faithful? Or are we going to just wring our hands? So we get to this last section here. Of Romans chapter 15. I want us to take a look at this. Starting in verse 14. I'm going to read through 21. It says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you, are, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of, of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glorify in Christ Jesus and all in the things which uh, pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Iconum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to him he was not announced, they shall see. And to those who have not heard shall understand. And so Paul is, is writing, he's saying, hey... I just, I just want you to understand something. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I've been hard on you. You know, we, we, look at, we look at Romans, and Romans has been tough. We, we had a couple of sermons that we talked about going to the deep end of the pool on that probably you might have left here and your head might have hurt a little bit because I know mine sure hurt when I was studying it. <laughs> and we go, man, how, how does this all work? How does this all fit together? But the thing of it is, is when we look at it, he's saying, I know you're full of goodness and you're able to admonish one another. You're able to encourage. You're able to correct one another. And he says, I've written to you because of what the Lord has given. He's told me, go witness, go minister to the Gentiles and tell them. And so he was, he was tough with some stuff. And he's saying, I, I, I just want to make sure that I bring this because I'm wanting to do it that the Gentiles may be acceptable. Uh, they, they may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, that they would be an offering that... that that would please God. So what does that mean? Why is Paul writing this? You know, here we are nearly 2,000 years after he wrote this stuff. Why, 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 what's, he's writing it so we would know who Jesus is and what he's done for us, that we would live a life that is honoring to God so that when we come before the Lord, that we wouldn't be ashamed of the life that we live, that we would be able to look before Jesus and say, Lord, I've, I've, I've done my best for you. 
that when we're in front of Jesus, we can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. This is why he wrote this. Do you realize this is why Paul, God didn't let Paul continue on? We're going to list this last little section. We're going to see Paul had plans that he never got to see put to action. You know what his plans were in his twilight years? He was wanting to go all the way over to Spain and start preaching Jesus in Spain. He never got there. You might be going, well, why didn't God... Because God needed to... He said, Paul, sit. Right. Stay. Don't move. In fact, he had to put him in prison to make him sit and stay. Right. Because there's going to be people on down the line that need to hear what you have to say. Praise the Lord that he made Paul sit and stay. That we have so many places in our Bible that explains the gospel a little bit clearer, that we can get a little bit more in depth. Let's get that last few verses here. Verse 22. For this reason I have been much hindered from coming to you. What does he mean? He's saying, I've been, I, as I've been going, I've been sharing the gospel, and God's been taking me here, and he's been telling me there, and, he's been, and I've been starting churches and telling people about Jesus and going wherever the Holy Spirit would take me, and he just keeps me from going to you. Every time I get ready ahead to you, he says, no, I need you over here. And Paul's saying, yes, sir, and he heads over here. But I really want to get to them. I, really, I, just, I want to go see them so bad, Lord. I need you over here. Yes, sir. I need you over here. Yes, sir. He's saying, For this reason I have also been hindered in coming to you, but now, no longer having a place in these parts. He's saying, I finished my task and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Arcasia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed that they are, they are, debtor, or they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of, the, of their spiritual things, their duty also to minister to them in the material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to, uh, sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayer to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be ex acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and may we fresh together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Do you see what he, he was plan he was he had planned. He was like, I'm gonna go get to see my friends in Rome. Now you might be going, you know, he, he didn't start the church. How, when we get to chapter 16, we're gonna see he knows a ton of people that are in Rome. It's his friends that ended up moving over there and they started the churches, and so he knew they had a great foundation. That's why he could say, I have confidence that you're, you know what you're supposed to do. I have confidence that you can help each other, that you can encourage each other. I just, you ever, when you're a parent, do you ever tell something to your kids? And you know they know that that's what they're supposed to do. But Lucas can attest to you. Sometimes I just tell them anyhow. I say, now I, I feel better that I told you. <laughs> that's what the book of Romans is. I just feel better I've told you. But we see he, he had this plan. He was going to go to Spain. And he's saying, pray that, that, they're going to, they're, that I'm going to be able to deal with the people who are against me in, in Judea. Pray that, that the, the, my brothers and sisters there will see my service and they will approve of it. And they will understand what I'm doing. And that they will praise God because of it. And he says, I'm looking forward to coming and resting with you. Now you might be going... Why, why do we need to read this? He never got to accomplish this. What's the point? There is a, a wonderful story that they, they were talking about the reformer Martin Luther. And there is, there is somebody who is supposed to have come to Martin Luther and says, you know, Martin, if, if you knew that the Lord was coming back today, what would you do? 
And Martin looks at them with all seriousness in his face, and he says, I plant a tree. And you might be going, what in the world does that mean? Why in the world, if he knew Jesus was coming back, would he go and plant a tree? He says, basically what he's trying to tell them is, I want the Lord to know that I'm, I'm, I'm planning on keep going. He's going to have to tell me when to stop. Because I'm going to keep serving the Lord until my dying breath. Paul had plans to go to Spain. He wanted to see the gospel shared even farther. He didn't go, well, I've done everything. I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know. No, he was, he was planning on going farther. What are we going to do? Are we going to see the state of the world and say, well, we've done all that we can. We're just going to sit here and wait for Jesus to come back. And, and we're just going to try to, to endure. And, and we're just going to... Or do we keep going? I would love to see the Lord lifted up. I'd love to see Laporte have a massive revival. I'd love to see Indiana. I'd love to see United States. I'd love to see the world have a massive revival. And I want to keep working until the Lord comes back or the Lord calls me home and tells me stop. I hope that that's your heart too. That we want to work, that we want to support each other. We want, to, we want to be a witness for this world until the Lord says, it's enough. Because until then, he never said the word retirement in Scripture. You may have to retire from your task. You may not be able to go out on the road and, and do this or that, but you, until the Lord calls you home, you can always pray. You can always be an example for those that are around you until the Lord calls you home. You know, I, I'm so blessed. I still have my grandfather with me. My grandfather is 93 years old this year. He lost a leg. He's had some really horrible health issues that's come up. He's in a nursing home. But what was amazing was I got to hear a story of he had a young man who was helping him out, nurse's aide, and he still is teaching lessons. He's still helping people. This kid came in, and my, my grandfather, since he's had time in a nursing home, he was an engineer in his, his career. And we started getting him these things because we wanted him to be, you know, he he's, feels kind of bored. He's not somebody who watches TV, isn't the, that type of person. And so he's been working on these things, and, and the, one of the little nurse's aides, he came in, and he was, thought this was really neat, and he picked it up, and he was being a little rough. He's like, whoa, stop. And then he had a point to teach him. And the thing that, that he got to teach that kid was, you know, hey, be careful. You know, and he, he, got to, he got to just show him some love. And I, I remember when I was a kid, my grandfather doing those things for me. I haven't seen him be, feel up to doing that type of stuff for years. And yet here he is. And, and every time we see him, he, he, I really think he thinks it's going to be the last time he sees us. Because he always takes me aside and always says, make sure you take care of your family. Make sure you love the Lord. He causes me to cry every time I see him. But I am thankful. And I have no doubt my grandfather is going to serve the Lord until the day the Lord says, enough. Come home. I want to be that type of person. I hope you want to be that type of person. Let's bear each other's burdens. Let's be an example for the world. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Lord, it might seem like a weird way to close out this book where you've had so much theology and, and so many things where he's helping us understand and, and then he just says, hey, help each other. Love each other. Be united. Follow the example of Jesus. But Lord, there is so much there that we can take away. So much. Lord, help us to be the people that you want us to be. Let us finish strong. You've called us for this time. You put us on this earth for now. Lord, we see the, the state of the world. We, we go, man, it, it's got to be soon. And Lord, I, I think we're going to see it here in the near future. But Lord, help us to not give up. Help us not surrender. Help us not to sit and wring our hands. Lord, help us to be faithful until you come back. 
Lord, I hope that you find me doing good when you come back. I hope I'm not staring up in the sky waiting for the trumpet to sound, but Lord, I'm sharing the gospel with somebody. I'm helping somebody. I'm showing them love. I'm doing something good with the very last breath that you give me. I pray that we would all do that. Lord, as we have this time of inv invitation, Lord, I don't know what's on in people's hearts and minds, Lord. I don't know how you've spoken to them. But Lord, if somebody needs to come for prayer, Lord, I pray that they would be bold enough to step out and come for prayer. Lord, if, they, if they're here and they, they, they've been thinking about making this church their home, Lord, I pray that if you put it on their heart that this is where they need to be, Lord, that you'd have them come forward and, and ask to join this church. Lord, if, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I know this, this hasn't necessarily been a salvation type message, but Lord, if you're speaking to them that they need to know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray they come up here that we can talk about that. And Lord, that they can know that they have the hope, that hope that you talked about, that we have this, this confidence, assurance that we know that you are going to bring us salvation. You are going to bring us eternal life. That we may not see it right now, but Lord, you have promised it and you are going to keep that promise. Lord, as we come to you in this time of prayer, Lord, just help us to do what you'd have us to do as we leave this place. We thank you and praise you for it. In your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.